This week on the GCN Racing News Show, the third and final Grand Tour of the season has started and I'll look back at the opening sprint stages dominated by Sam Bennett and how Jumbo Visma are seemingly playing pro cycling manager as they share the race lead amongst three different riders. We will also have the Bima Cycle Classics, European Championships, Tour de Limousin, Tour of Denmark, and I'll be talking about Nairo Quintana. He's been stripped of his sixth place at the Tour de France after two anti-doping samples show traces of a banned substance. <laughs> I shall start though with La Vuelta a España, which commenced on Friday with a 24 km team time trial around Utrecht in the Netherlands. Jumbo Visma, the home team, were last off the ramp and basically demolished everybody else. Robert Heysink, who is racing his 17th year for the team in its various incarnations, was allowed to cross the line first and go into the leader's red jersey. A really nice gesture from the team for a rider who spent the last few years of his career solely working for other riders. Ineos Grenadiers and Quickstep Alpha Vinyl finished second and third respectively, getting Carapaz and Avonapool off to a solid start with their GC ambitions. Simon Yates could be satisfied too. Team Bike Exchange finished fourth that evening despite sending off early in damper conditions, but the big losers were EF Education Easy Post, whose GC riders lost one minute and 19 seconds, which is a big chunk of time after just one stage of the race. The following two stages were always going to finish in bunch sprint, especially with a lack of wind, and that's exactly what we got. Alpes and Fenex were not happy to have all the responsibility of controlling and chasing the breakaway on the first of those stages, and that's partly because Tim Malia was beaten on the day. In a messy finale, Danny Van Poppel managed to perfectly guide Sam Bennett into the final 200 metres, and in the drag strip race to the finish line, the Irishman proved faster than everybody else. A win at the Eschborn Frankfurt was about all he had to shout about until Sunday this season, so it must have come as a huge relief for him to get himself off the mark so early in the race. Second on that stage went to Mass Pedersen of Trek Segafredo, and both him and Bennett showed their intentions when it comes to the points classification by also contending the late intermediate sprint. In the general classification, there was a reshuffle of the Jumbo Visma riders at the top, with a fourth place on the day, meaning that Mike Turnerson took the red jersey off his compatriot Hessing's shoulders. It was more of the same yesterday, albeit with a larger and stronger breakaway, and a couple of teams to help Alperson control the peloton. It was the same result at the end of it, though. Danny Van Poppel, once again the MVP, smoothly guiding Sam Bennett into position. Uh, here's Adam Bly's analysis of the final few hundred metres from our breakaway show post-race yesterday. This is a heli shot here, and this point here, that's Pascal Ackerman on the front there, and this is a point here, Tim Malia, that's where he unclipped. You've got Brian Kakar there, Dan McClay, but look, he's already in the wind fighting. He's just going to start his sprint from there. You've got Danny Van Poppel on the far left-hand side with Sam Bennett on his wheel and Mads Pedersen. Danny's at full tilt already, launching Sam, and so is Dan as well. Dan McClay in the centre of the screen. Tim Malia out of vision now, but just watch this point here. As Mads Pedersen comes in the middle, Dan and Sam are going to come together and Mads gets stuck in this wheel. After he backs out of that little spot there, eases off the pedals, gets back on the gas. And this is the point here, he does start to just come back at him ever so slightly. I think if he'd have just ran on that other side of the wheel, he might have had a better chance at running for that win. But Sam Bennett, once again, he was, he was unbelievable in his power and the strength he had today. But Danny Van Poppel, I think, you know, as Dan said yesterday, for me, he's probably the best lead out man in the world right now. That marks the 10th Grand Tour stage win for Sam Bennett, who's now won at least one stage of the last five Grand Tours he started. And what a turnaround. It's been a torrid season by Sam Bennett's standards, with just one win to his name going into this race. He and the rest of that team will now be full of confidence for the rest of this race and probably the rest of this season. And there was another change yesterday in the red jersey. The rider that Jumbo Visma decided to take to, uh, the red jersey to Spain was Eduardo Affini, who finished 20th on the stage versus Turnison's 150th, albeit on the same time. 
Not everyone, unfortunately, though, will be heading to Spain today, at least not with the race. Steph Crass of Lotto Sudel was involved in a crash on stage two, which left him with multiple fractures. Whilst yesterday, Mike Woods of Israel Premier Tech came down in one of those silly crashes in the early part of the stage. Now, he didn't fracture any bones, thankfully, but he did suffer a concussion. So he'll now return home to start his recovery, with which we wish him all the best. In the other classifications, it's the Ineos Grenadiers rider Ethan Hayter who has the white jersey on his shoulders, as he has done since the opening day of the race. The King of the Mountains jersey is being worn by Julius Vandenberg of EF Education Easy Post, who put in a couple of fantastic sprints on the only KOMs we've had so far. Missed out to Thomas de Ghent yesterday, but he's in those blue polka dot jersey colours. Uh, the race is going to resume tomorrow with the first of two interesting looking stages around the Basque Country. I'll have more details on them later on. Over in Germany, we had the Beamer C Classics, a race that has been had more names than I care to remember over the past few years. Now, often that one is finishing in a bunch sprint, and as such, we had a huge number of star sprinters on the start. Unfortunately for them, though, this year was different. A group of five riders pulled clear and fought it out at the finish. One of them being Wout van Aert in his first competitive outing since the Tour de France. Now, with his presence in that group, I think we were all questioning how on earth they were going to go about trying to beat him at the line. For a hands goer had two riders out of the five, but rather than throwing in the expected attacks in the closing couple of kilometers, they chose to ride for a sprint backing Marco Haller. A ballsy move, but one that paid off. Uh, Van Aert seemingly fell asleep in the last 200 metres, looking the wrong way just as Haller started his sprint. It was close at the line, but he held off Van Aert and Quentin Hermans of Antomarche, who took third. Now, Haller's reaction to the win was one of the best I've seen in a long time. Check it out. Fantastic. I think he was quite pleased with that win yesterday. And the Tour of Denmark, Jumbo Visma added four more wins to their incredible 2022 season. 20-year-old sprint sensation Olaf Koy was the dominant sprinter there, winning on the opening day and then again on stage three. Uh, the GC had an early shake-up though on stage two with an individual time trial, won by another 20-year-old, Magnus Sheffield of the Ineos Grenadiers. He covered that 12 kilometer course at an average speed just shy of 54 kilometers per hour, finishing three seconds ahead of Trek Segafredo's Matthias Skilmos. Uh, it was the man in third, though, that Sheffield had the most to worry about when it came to the general classification. Christophe Laporte only conceded six seconds that day to the American, and that was going to make the bonus seconds crucial over the remaining stages of the race. He took six of those the very following day by finishing second to his teammate Coy after doing his lead out, but still trailed Sheffield by fractions of a second. They were unable to take any on stage four, won in a sprint by Jasper Philipson of Alperson de Koenig, and so it all came down to the hilly final stage. And what a stage that was. And unfortunately, we don't have any worldwide clip rights for the Tour of Denmark, so we can't show it here on the Racing News Show. But if you haven't watched it and you're not in Denmark, I'd recommend watching the final 1500 meters because it was brilliant. Uh, the one two on the GC was the one two on the day, but unfortunately for Sheffield, he was second and Laporte first, giving the Frenchman the bonus seconds that he needed to also take the general classification. Uh, that marked the 39th and 40th wins of the season for Jumbo Visma, who are now equal with Quickstep Alpha Vinyl for total wins so far this year. And if you're wondering how Egan Bernal got on on his return to competition, the answer is not too badly at all. He was on domestique duties for much of the race, helping Magnus Sheffield on the final stage before abandoning when his work for the day was done. So all in all, a very positive return, which is absolutely fantastic to see. In France, the four-day Tour du Limousin concluded on Sunday, a race that would have been very pleased with the quality of the start list this year, much of which was down to that much talked about relegation battle. Now, if you looked at the results sheet and indeed the photo from the end of stage one, you might have assumed that Julien Simon of Total Energies had won in a bunch sprint, but he'd actually put in a trademark late attack, managing to keep Matteo Trentin and Alex Aramburu at bay. Aaron Buru got his own win on stage two in what was a bunch sprint, taking himself into the race leader's jersey in the process. Uh, the finale of the third stage was largely shaped 
by a wrong turn taken by a couple of riders inside the closing kilometres of that day. Uh, Rui Costa, the former world champion of UAE Team Emirates, lost out the most. He'd been leading the stage at that point and understandably wasn't particularly happy when he realised that he had gone off course. Now there was a bit of a lull after that as it seemed like the group waited for the yellow jersey to regain contact. Uh, but ultimately UAE did have something to celebrate with Diego Ulisi taking what's his second win of the season so far. Uh, behind him, Van Avermaet was in second with Aaron Buru third. So going into the final day, Aaron Buru had an eight second advantage over Ulisi in the GC, a lead he added to on that fourth and final day. Uh, another late attack, this time from Vincenzo Albanese of Yolo Cometa, paid off with a stage win for the Italian, but winning the sprint behind him was more than enough for Aaron Buru to seal the deal on what was his first ever overall stage race win. 100 UCI points in the bag for Mobistar for that, plus those that he and Garcia Cortina gained on the stages, made it a very successful race for the Spanish World Tour squad, who hope to remain World Tour, of course, next year. Time now for me to let you know what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week. Uh, the Vuelta España will resume tomorrow with the first of those two stages in the Basque Country. Uh, so the stage tomorrow has two and a half thousand metres of climbing between Vitoria and La Guardia, with a stepped climb in the final 15 kilometres, followed by an uphill drag to the line, which should be enough, maybe, to entice the GC riders into action. We may well have a change in the leader's red jersey, that's for sure. Maybe it's for Julio Alaphilippe. Uh, you'll find out tomorrow. We'll be live with the breakaway from 1330 BST with live coverage of that stage starting shortly afterwards. Aside from La Vuelta, we have plenty of other live racing action for you. Uh, Fabio Jakobsen, Olaf Koy and Alexander Christoph and Phil Bauhaus are amongst the sprinters lining up for the five-day Deutschland Tour, which starts on Wednesday. It's available to watch live or on demand on GCN Plus if you're in Europe or the US, the Middle East, North Africa and the Asia Pacific, excluding China, Japan, New Zealand and Australia. Further to that, two big World Tour one-day races are coming up this weekend in northwestern France. So on Saturday, it's the women's peloton who will be in action at the Grand Prix Lorient Agglom Agglomeration. And the following day, it's the men's turn in what is essentially the same race under a different name, the Breton Classic, which I can just about pronounce. Uh, they are actually amongst my favourite races each and every year because it's one of those parkour that offers opportunities for sprinters and also for attackers. And finally, if you're into your mountain biking, we've got the UCI World Championship starting this week, and you'll be able to watch those various events if you're in Europe, excluding Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Italy, and France. Talking of mountain biking, Tom Pidcock added a further title to his Palmares last week by taking the European Championships, despite a crash in the very first corner, which left him with around 50 positions to make up. Uh, conditions couldn't have been more different though for the women's race the following day, with heavy rain making much of the course unrideable. 23-year-old Loana Lecomte of France took the gold medal though, and the championships jersey at the end of that race. In the women's road race, the Dutch added to their success from the men's the previous week. Uh, Lorena Vibes has rarely been beaten in a sprint this year, and she added an 18th win to her season yesterday from just 41 race days. However, it's much closer than she's been used to, with a photo finish required before she was declared the winner. World champion Elisa Balsamo had to settle for silver, with her teammate Raquel Barbieri in third on the day. Meanwhile, the Tour de l'Avenir is well underway now, a race which more often than not gives us a very good idea as to who we expect to see winning Grand Tours over the next few years. Uh, the Dutch won the opening short prologue TTT with an average speed north of 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, the times there didn't count towards the GC though, so whoever won the first road stage 24 hours later would also claim the yellow jersey. And that went to Søren Varenskuld after a brilliant late attack, backing up the two wins that he took this time last year in this race. Somebody signed that man up. Kasper van Uden, who you may remember took fourth place at the Skelder Prix in the spring, won the sprint finish at the end of stage two. And then yesterday, it was the Danish rider Adam Holm Jorgensen who got to raise his arms in victory. Uh, the man who finished second on the day though, Jordan Labros of France, had the consolation of taking the overall lead in the race. Uh, which continues through to this Sunday, and you'll be able to watch the last two stages live on GCN+. In other news, we unfortunately had to bid a fond farewell to Tom de Moulin last week, at least from the professional cycling world. The Dutchman had already announced that he'd be retiring at the end of this season, but having not felt himself for some time now, decided to retire with immediate effect. 
It's a shame for us and it's a shame for cycling, but de Moulin's problems in recent years are well documented. And I think we can all agree that he's made the right decision for himself. So on behalf of all of us, thank you, Tom, for all the entertainment and all the inspiration and everything you've provided over the years. Wish you all the best in the next chapter of your career. Now, the other major story last week was around Naira Quintana, who was stripped of his sixth place at the recent Tour de France after two of his anti-doping samples were found to contain traces of tramadol. Now, tramadol is a very strong painkiller, not banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency, but it is banned by the UCI, cycling's governing body. Now, despite having the result taken away from him, he could have taken the start of La Vuelta, which had been the original plan, uh, but he and the team made the decision not to. Now, it's a subject that we spoke about on the breakaway on Friday evening after the first stage of La Vuelta. Here is what we had to say. Tramadol is banned within cycling. And once again, we have international headlines with a rider who has been flagged for a positive within the rules of cycling. In any other sport, Tramadol is not banned. It is a simple painkiller. Does cycling do itself favours by going beyond the world's anti-doping agency rules? and making it even stricter for cycling and constantly flagging the ways in which this can be flouted. Well, I think you can look at it in two ways. In one way, it's doing itself a disservice because once again, like you said, we've got headlines and videos and whatever else going on, which puts cycling into a bad light. There's a rider from the Tour de France, his sixth place taken away from him because he's tested positive for a drug. You know, most of the general public will look at that in one way, saying, yeah, cyclists, they've always been like that. We've heard all of the stories before. On the other hand, I think it's a great thing that the UCI are going above and beyond the, what the wider code is if they feel that there's a safety issue or if they feel it's performance enhancing and therefore riders shouldn't be taking it. So I think, you know, cycling's got itself into a decent position. You know, a lot of people would disagree with me on this, mm. but I think it's in a decent position, particularly compared to 20 years ago, but even compared to 10 years ago. You know, we come from a point where riders were taking blood bags during a Tour de France to a decade or so later, riders like Taylor Finney and Steve Cummings say, actually, I don't want to take any pills, even if they're inside the rules and I am able to take them. I just don't feel comfortable in putting themselves inside my, my body. So I think it's come a really long way. But like you said, the, the sport is so contrary from one to the other. If you get a tennis star like Rafa Nadal, he'll be applauded and celebrated for going through the pain of an injury with the use of medication to do that. And he'll be seen as a hero for doing that. So it's contravening from one sport to the other. But I'm glad that cycling is where it is at the moment. I'm glad that the UCI have gone above and beyond and, and banned a substance that's not banned elsewhere. And then this is the problem that cycling has, essentially. It is judged by a different standard to every other sport. And that is a mess of its own making. It is, but I think it's, it's sending a clear message, isn't it? No one wants to have any sort of doping allegation next to their name whatsoever. So the cycling, all it's doing for me is just making it as clean as possible, putting people off taking absolutely anything that's going to be even slightly performing and enhancing. So I think they're doing a brilliant job of trying to do that. It's just the way that every other sport deals with Tramadol, whatever it might be within their sports. Like you say, Nadal's applauded for getting through as a hero and winning another Grand Slam. It's a load of rubbish. It's just ridiculous. It is ridiculous, though. In, in our sport, if that happened, they'd be like, he's a cheat. He's mm -hmm. a cheat. No one else is doing that. It's just, yeah, I, I just think cycling's in a, a great place, as you said, and it's just making it as clean as possible and putting anyone off doing it, because otherwise they're just going to be tarnished. Yeah, I guess we can only hope that it helps to discourage athletes whenever something that is so freely available in other sports is banned in this sport and it... it, it results in a disqualification from the puts, Tour de France. It also puts sponsors off. Yeah. Off teams, Which is you know. also the problem, though, isn't it? Because every sport needs sponsors. It is, yeah, but then it's also, what do you want to do? Do you want to sponsor the cleanest sport mm. in the world cycling? Do you want to sponsor a team that scrutinise against Tremadol use? Why well, not? That, that, I mean, that is a problem for cycling in that we talk about the contrasting opinions from the general public mm -hmm. about sports. I don't think sponsors care about what drugs riders are, or, sorry, athletes are and aren't taking. They're only caring really about the publicity that that generates. So if on the tennis or the football or the other side of things, it's not generating a load of negative publicity, they don't mind. Uh, you can let us know your thoughts on Naira Quintana and what's happened in the comment section just down below. In much better news, Dan Bigham, already the British hour record holder, made an attempt at breaking Victor Campenart's world record in Grenchen, Switzerland on Friday. Now, he was behind the benchmark for the first half an hour, but we were reliably informed that was all part of the plan. And indeed it was. Uh, by the time the clock counted down to zero, 
Begum had ridden 55.548 kilometers, adding almost 500 meters to that world record. And I've got to say, I've got so much respect for Dan Bigham. By his own admission, he's not the most talented bike rider out there. However, his knowledge on how to cut through the air as quickly as possible is pretty much unrivaled. Chapeau. Now, I'm sure that Alex and Ollie will be talking about that record in more detail, including all the tech on this week's tech show, if you would like to check that out. Uh, Rumours, incidentally, are that Filippo Ganna might make his own attempt a little bit sooner than he recently suggested. And since he rides for the team that Bigham now works for, you wonder how much advice Bigham's actually going to give him on how to break the record. I'm sure he will. Now, I shall finish with some transfer and contract news. Uh, Michal Kwiatkowski has extended his contract with Ineos Grenadiers in a deal that will see him remain there until at least the end of 2025, which is 10 years after he first joined the team. Larry Warbass has also extended with AG2R through to the end of next season. And we also got confirmation last week that Wilco Kelderman and Dylan Van Baal will be in Jumbo Visma's colours as of next year, moving from Bora Hansgrohe and Ineos Grenadiers respectively. And also that Richard Carapaz is leaving the Ineos Grenadiers. He'll be an EF Education First rider as of the 1st of January. And finally, Kasper Asgreen has decided to end his season early in consultation with team doctors due to fatigue syndrome. That is all for this week's show. I'll be back with another racing wrap-up this time next week, but I'll also be back on the breakaway and in commentary for stage four of Lab Welter tomorrow, so I'll see you then.